Good morning, good evening. Uh, welcome to this conference on contemporary literacy on anti-corruption organized by UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, ROLAC, the Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Center, and several other partners that we sincerely thank and appreciate. Um, we have a very ambitious agenda today. My name is Alex Mejia. I'm a division director at UNITAR and your host uh, for the day. Without uh, further ado, I would uh, like to uh, start the proceedings by inviting uh, His Excellency Dr. Ali Benfetais Almarri, the UN Special Advocate for the Prevention of Corruption, and also the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Center, and a member of the Board of Trustees of UNITAR to share his welcome remarks via video message. Thank you very much. We will listen to the video now. السيد ميخيل سيد مساعد الأمين العام للأمم المتحدة رئيس معهد الأمم المتحدة للتدريب والبحث السيد أليكس مخايا مدير إدارة الشعوب والإدماج الاجتماعي لمعهد الأمم المتحدة للتدريب والبحث السادة الأساتذة والخبراء والضيوف الكرام السيدات والسادة الحضور بصفتي رئيسا لمجلس أمناء مركز حكم القانون ومكافحة الفساد رولاك وعضو بمجلس أمناء معهد الأمم المتحدة للتدريب والبحث يونيتار وبجنيف أتشرف بأن نفتتح اليوم مؤتمر مقاربة التخصصات لمكافحة الفساد منذ سنوات بدأت الجهود الإقليمية والدولية والوطنية تتشكل لبناء نهج علمي متكامل لموضوع مكافحة الفساد وأثناء هذا البناء تكشفت حقائق عديدة على رأسها التداخل الكبير للفساد مع كافة مناحي الحياة سواء كانت اقتصادية أو اجتماعية أو ثقافية وبالتالي كان لا بد من مواجهة كل مناحي ظاهرة وكل ظاهرة على حدة وأثناء هذه الرحلة الطويلة والمتشعبة لإيجاد وبناء أدبيات ومناهج حول كيفية مكافحة الفساد في تلك الموضوعات المختلفة مثل حقوق الإنسان والتنمية المستدامة ظهر وباء كورونا واستقرق العالم في مواجهته ما يقارب العامين والنصف وكان الخوف أن يوجد هذا الوباء سبل جديدة لمزيد من الفساد أو أن يؤخر الخطوات الجادة التي اتخذتها العديد من الحكومات في مجال مكافحة الفساد ولكن ظلت لنا نظرة إيجابية كان لابد من طرحها اليوم وهناك مجموعة من الأسئلة كان منها هل كان وباء كورونا أكثر فائدة في مجال نشر ثقافة محاربة الفساد بعد أن كانت التدريبات تتم عبر طريقة الحضور المباشر لعدد محدود من الدارسين والخبراء أصبحت بعد الوباء وبسبب القيود الصحية المفروضة على الحضور تتم عن طريق الحضور الافتراضي عبر مواقع التواصل الاجتماعي المختلفة ومن ثم أصبحت الأعداد المستفيدة أكبر وانتشار المعلومة أسرع وعلى نطاق أوسع ومن ثم يمكن القول أن الوباء جانب للوباء جانب مشرق في مجال نشر وتدريب مادة مكافحة الفساد أعتقد أن حالة التأهب والترقب المصاحبة للوباء والتي منعت عقد الاجتماعات المباشرة قد لفتت نظرنا إلى أنه يمكننا إيصال نفس المعلومات بشكل أقل وعلى نظام أوسع وهو ما يؤكد نظرتنا الإيجابية نتفق ونختلف في عدة قضايا ولكن مع ذلك كله ومع الجانب المشرق لقضية نشر المعلومة بهذه السرعة وهذا الكم إلا أننا افتقدنا أيضا إلى الحوار المباشر 
وعندما يكون الحوار مباشر فعملية الإقناع وعملية التجاوب بين الأشخاص أقرب إلى النفس من قضية التواصل عبر هذه الأجهزة إن الهدف الرئيسي من كل ما تقوم به الدول والهيئات والمنظمات والمراكز البحثية هو السيطرة على هذا الداء لوضع أسس لنهضة الدول التي طالت كبوتها بسبب الفساد وبسبب الظلم وما يواكبه من فقر وضياع فرص لشرائح كبيرة من أبناء الدول ولذلك فإنني أثمن دور هذا المؤتمر والذي يقترب في عنوانه وموضوعه والذي تناوله من اتباع منهج تكاملي يجمع بين البعد المؤسسي للفساد والبعد القطاعي له والتركيز على كل من البعد القيمي الذي أصبحت أهميته تتنامى بسبب عدم إضافة إلى تسليط الضوء على البعد العالمي هذه الظاهرة وهو البعد العالمي هذه الظاهرة وهو بعد لم يحظى باهتمام كاف في أدبيات هذه الظاهرة وهذا التناول يتكامل مع ما يقوم به مركز حكم القانون ومكافحة الفساد وما ندعو إليه منذ سنوات من دور هام لمكافحة الفساد عن طريق التعليم حيث قدمنا درجة الماجستير في مكافحة الفساد بالتعاون مع جامعة سيسكس البريطانية كما دعمنا تدريس مادة مكافحة الفساد في عدد من الجامعات حول العالم فضلا عن دعمنا للمبادرة الأكاديمية لمكافحة الفساد كما تشرفنا بتقديم الجائزة الدولية في مكافحة الفساد جائزة سمو الأمير الشيخ تميم بن حمد الفان والتي تقدم سنويا منذ عام 2016 وتكرم أبطال أثنوا حياتهم في مكافحة الفساد أو قدموا أفكار إبداعية أو تعليمية متطورة أو قدموا أعمال صحفية متميزة ونضيف إلى فئاتها هذا العام من قدموا جهودا متميزة في مجال مكافحة الفساد في الرياضة كما قدمنا العديد من الدورات التدريبية للتعاون مع معهد الأمم المتحدة للتدريب والبحث العلمي يونيتار ومكتب الأمم المتحدة المعني بالمخدرات والجريمة UNODC ومن بينها دورات باللغة العربية والأسبانية سيتم طرحها في ختام هذا المؤتمر وكان قد سبق تقديم دورات مماثلة باللغة الإنجليزية كل ما سبق يؤكد الاتجاه الواضح إلى دعم كافة جهود محاربة الفساد على كافة الأصعدة وأملنا هو تقليل معدلات الفساد والنجاح بإذن الله تعالى في هذه الحرب الضروس أتمنى لكم التوفيق والوصول لأفكار تدعم الجهود المبذولة لمكافحة الفساد حول العالم إلى أن نلتقي تقبلوا أصبر تحياتكم We uh, thank you very much. Um, we can um, uh, now proceed. Um, again, uh, this is your friend Alex when he is speaking from uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Um, uh, we, before we actually um, go to the first panel of this conference, which is organized um, along today and tomorrow, the first session being this morning, Geneva time, the second session being this afternoon, Geneva time, and uh, the last session, the third session being tomorrow, um, in the morning. Before we do that, and uh, just to echo what Dr. Ali has um, very um, uh, well said in a holistic manner, let me just uh, remind the audience uh, virtually that the Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Center, ROLAC, duly represented today by its director, Dr. Yasser Refaya, a good friend of the United Nations as well, of UNITAR. ROLAC and UNITAR have joined efforts to organized this initiative inspired in the five alarms raised by the UN Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres. These five priorities for the UN system and hopefully for the world um, were presented at the beginning of this year. And as you heard, and as you know, I'm sure we are all facing challenges with COVID-19, the global financial crisis, climate change, lawlessness of cybersecurity, as well as peace and security with a conflict in Ukraine 
um, that everyone, uh, of course, uh, follows through the news. Um, with this scenario, uh, corruption should be considered as a cross-cutting element that is even more damaging in times of crisis. There is a growing lack of public trust that needs to be restored towards building back better societies for all. This inclusive dialogue is then envisaged to also consider gender and regional balance as elements needed to take stock on the current situation and possibilities to move forward from theory to practice. In that light, we sincerely thank all the panelists that I will be um, introduced properly in a few uh, minutes. Likewise, we uh, want to share with you the other participants that we will be launching four e-learning courses on anti-corruption related to sustainable development, um, the use of technologies, anti-corruption and human rights, and all of these courses in English, Arabic, and Spanish, respectively. We will be celebrating three round tables, as I mentioned before, uh, throughout the day today and tomorrow. And uh, just uh, as, as a matter of uh, logistics and a point of order, uh, just remember that the same link will be serving for all the conference, so you can disconnect at the end of this session, uh, perhaps to have lunch if you are in Europe or in our time zone, and then connect again uh, for the session in the afternoon and then um, uh, tomorrow morning, as I mentioned. Um, very important also uh, to say that um, uh, we are very encouraged by the participants that have um, uh, already registered for the three uh, parts of this uh, conference. And of course, we will be happy to issue certificates of participation to all of you that join us in the three uh, panels. And uh, with that, let me uh, now go back um, to the agenda proper now that we have heard from Dr. Ali Benfetais Almari, the UN Special Advocate for the Prevention of Corruption, uh, Chairman of the World of Trustees of ROLAC, and a member of the Board of UNITAR. Um, for the first speaker, the next slide, if I may. Um, for the first speaker of this uh, ambitious agenda, we have uh, Mr. Robert uh, Barrington, a former member of the Board of Directors of Transparency International and a professor at the University of Sussex. Uh, professor Barrington, it's quite an honor to have you here and uh, to offer you the floor uh, before, not before I, I mention something which is very important uh, for our participants. Uh, it is important to know that your research uh, focuses on global corruption trends and corruption in developed economies. And uh, also, if I may, that you lecture on the Masters in Corruption and Governance and the LLM on Corruption, Law and Governance uh, that is uh, run in conjunction with ROLAC at our universities. As mentioned, you are uh, formerly the head of Transparency International in the UK and uh, remain a member of the Board of Directors. Um, it's uh, quite an honor also to know that you have worked as advisor to the public sector, including in the Ministry of Justice, as an expert um, uh, in the group drafting the official guidance on the Bribery Act in your country, and that you have publications to your credit, including understanding corruption, including how to bribe, including adequate procedures, a guidance to the UK Bribery Act, and corruption in the UK, an impressive uh, portfolio of books to your credit. Um, uh, finally, uh, to properly introduce Mr. Barrington, he holds a degree from Oxford University and a PhD from the European University Institute. With that, uh, dear Mr. Barrington, Professor Barrington, it's my pleasure to offer you the floor. Welcome. Thank you, and uh, hello to everybody from the south coast of the United Kingdom. Um, it's a great honor to be uh, invited to speak today, and um, I would uh, like to thank both uh, UNITAR and uh, our old friends uh, at ROLAC. Uh, with whom we at Sussex have a long-standing relationship, which is very valued. Um, I'm going to speak today um, very briefly about the, the context of corruption and global emergencies. And to do that, I will share my screen and um, talk through five slides. So what I want to look at this morning is um, the link between global emergencies and corruption. Uh, often, I think, when global emergencies arrive, um, significant global issues of the kind that um, you were outlining just now, uh, it's very easy to overlook the aspect of corruption because so many other factors are coming into play and responses are needed immediately from uh, governments and the private sector. 
But um, we can also see that uh, corruption is both a cause and a consequence of global emergencies, a consequence, a result of global emergencies. And I'm going to use as an example uh, the case of COVID-19, as His Excellency referred to in his opening remarks. Uh, what we see is that corruption may not directly cause an emergency, especially a natural disaster, uh, but corruption can make a difficult situation much worse. And I'll illustrate that by looking briefly at the COVID-19 situ COVID situation. First of all, looking at corruption as a cause, there are good studies on corruption in the global healthcare system, uh, both at country level, uh, at regional level, uh, and at international level. And what we can see is that um, due to corruption, there is a lower capacity in the global healthcare system. And in a normal circumstance, that is already difficult for uh, those who require global health care. But in emergency situations, it becomes much more serious. We see that health care budgets can be misappropriated. Uh, you have poor infrastructure. And very importantly, you have a flight of talent from um, uh, health care systems where corruption is endemic uh, to health care systems where the, uh, the medical staff are more valued. You also, again, very importantly, see a lack of trust from citizens in the healthcare system. Uh, they don't have faith that if they uh, engage with the healthcare system, it will provide them with healthcare solutions. So, corruption as a consequence of the healthcare systems. Well, first, um, in COVID, uh, the COVID-19 situation, we saw that there was a huge public procurement spend around the world. Uh, on vaccinations, on protective equipment, uh, on ventilation equipment, and so on. But also at the same time, because it was an emergency, there was a relaxation of standard controls and procedures around public procurement, uh, which in many areas of the world were already not very strong. This gave extensive corruption opportunities. That means that money that should have been spent on equipment, on vaccinations, was diverted to uh, private benefits. We don't know exactly the scale of this at the moment because the, um, uh, the investigations are still ongoing, including in my own country, the United Kingdom. Uh, so it's not yet clear the, um, the scale, but it looks like the scale was very large and this did have an impact on the ability of the global healthcare system to respond. And finally, um, just to illustrate, I talked about the lack of trust from citizens in the healthcare systems. Of course, in countries where vaccinations were not uh, compulsory, and in most countries in the world, vaccinations were voluntary, uh, this, of course, uh, had the effect of undermining vaccination strategies, the lack of trust in the healthcare system. So I've used this COVID-19 example in the few minutes I've got just to illustrate that uh, this is a very complex um, system we've got going on. Uh, and corruption operates as both the cause or the, the exacerbator of, of uh, emergencies, and there are consequences in which corruption makes things worse. I think we can say that uh, understanding a problem thoroughly helps to find appropriate solutions. And my contention here is that when we're looking at emergencies, applying the lens of corruption to emergencies helps to understand the problem. As I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, it's very easy to overlook corruption in an emergency situation because so many other things are going on and often human life is at stake and needs to be dealt with immediately. Uh, but if you do overlook corruption, uh, you're not understanding the problem properly and therefore your solutions are not likely to be as effective. There isn't time to go fully into the examples uh, of the role of corruption in other emergencies, but just... Um, reflect for a moment on the role that corruption played in conflict recently, for example in Afghanistan, in Syria, and right now in Ukraine, um, and also in the financial crisis, issues around lax regulation and lax regulators who have been heavily lobbied by the financial services industry. So these points I think illustrate my contention that if you apply the lens of corruption to emergencies, you get a better understanding of what is happening. Emergencies are usually not all about corruption, but if you don't consider corruption, you're not considering the problem fully. So I leave you with four conclusions. Corruption is a contributor to emergencies. Corruption thrives during emergencies. 
understanding corruption helps to understand emergencies and therefore tackling corruption is fundamental to preventing and controlling emergencies. I will leave it there but very happily answer questions when we come to that part of our morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Barrington, indeed, uh, a holistic um, overview and a very important linkage uh, between emergency crisis and uh, corruption, especially in the day and age that we live um, through today. Um, we will go back to you, as you correctly mentioned, um, as soon as we have um, uh, questions and answers and final comments. Now, I understand that our colleague Anast Anastasia from UNTAD uh, was having uh, trouble connecting if that is correct, Ana Lucia would like to go to the next speaker. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. Um, uh, so it gives me a great pleasure uh, to introduce a good friend of the house, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Nahida Sohan, Ambassador of Bangladesh to Jordan, um, and of course, a career uh, diplomat from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of Bangladesh. Uh, she has an impressive um, uh, curriculum uh, she has been in this position since uh, February 2020, um, and she has worked as Director General of the United Nations and Human Rights Wing of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, before. In her, her previous capacity, she was in charge of dealing with issues like international peace and security, human rights, humanitarian, and climate change uh, issues. She has also served in several diplomatic capacities in um, <clears throat> missions, in diplomatic missions in Rome, in Kolkata and Geneva, which is when we met her. And she has uh, uh, closely followed uh, throughout these years uh, negotiations on climate change, her expertise, and uh, we can witness from unitary is quite outstanding. She has also acquired a specialty on human rights and migration issues uh, throughout her career and um, another um, areas that will reflect uh, her academic uh, profile. She has a master's of arts uh, degree in English literature from Dhaka University, is fluent in French, English, and Bangla. And she was also trained at the Hague Academy of International Law in the Netherlands, where she obtained a diploma in international relations from the Institute of Public Administration as well in Paris, in France. Um, with this, um, allow me to invite you, uh, dear Ambassador Sohan, to take the floor. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, Alexander Mejia for uh, such uh, illustrious uh, <laughs> and kind words for me and good to see you uh, quite some time. Uh, it's been quite some time. I would firstly like to uh, thank you Niter, for inviting me here. Uh, it's been uh, quite some time uh, but it's, it's quite interesting to see and also my greetings uh, from Jordan to the panelists as well and all the participants who are watching us. You know, it's, it's quite interesting to see that uh, in my capacity as uh, the Director General of United Nations in Bangladesh, in the Foreign Ministry, I, I was in charge of the corruption issues, which comes under UNPAC, you know, Convention Against Corruption. And when I was the Director General of Multilateral Economic Affairs, I was in charge of climate change issues. And partially in Geneva also, I was in charge of climate change issues. So it's kind of, I have to mix and match from both of my experiences and try to look at the things. But I, I think that uh, Secretary General has done a fantastic job in listing the five uh, priority areas and including uh, the area of um, climate change here and linking it with the uh, issue of corruption. Um, I will, I will uh, talk about three parts um, when I speak. Uh, one, the impact. You all, most of you know the impact, so I'll be very short on it. And then the areas to look into where we can find the loopholes. And then lastly, the areas where we can do more to strengthen the situation and uh, mitigate the loopholes. So firstly, on the impact, the impact of corruption on the uh, climate change uh, activities, mechanism, institutions, is that it is weakening the whole climate change regulations, firstly. Secondly, it is reducing the impact of clean energy programs globally, nationally and globally. And then it is increasing the vulnerability in both adaptation and mitigation activities. And in general, the vulnerability uh, of, of those who are already vulnerable. And uh, lastly, it has a huge impact in terms of climate financing. 
Now, second point, uh, the areas where into where we can look into for the uh, loopholes. Now, I, I see it uh, in three different ways. One is the financial, uh, the, and the other is the ethical question and also the moral question. Uh, now, uh, firstly, to talk about in mitigation, um, there are a number of areas and it is very interesting if you, if you can take a look uh, into uh, particularly the um, uh, Transparency International uh, uh, case and uh, Atlas, uh, you will find a list of issues there. Um, some of them are to uh, be mentioned here and I, I have add, uh, added from my own experience as well. One is to mention is in the mitigation, the fraud in the carbon market, uh, influencing uh, the policies and the policy makers and projects. When we take a project, when we plan a project, the corruption impacts on there and corrupt, there are, are chances of corruption happening there. In the forestry issue, uh, we all know the uh, big Amazon case, how it has impacted, and also the extraction issue, particularly in the mining. We, we see it in uh, many areas which is rich in mining, and we see how uh, uh, corruption has impacted in it, it in a way that has full impact on climate change issues. In adaptation, uh, the, the, um, it exists in financing and also in the project areas and some other or common general areas that we see everywhere. Um, one is about the corporate interest and the conflict of interest, which influences the policies. Uh, so this is something where we need to look into because most of the time what we do is we uh, regulate or we uh, monitor or we um, you know, make amendments or uh, monitoring put monitoring mechanisms or systems in the public sector, but a large chunk of private sector, uh, which is um, involved in corruption and that has impact on the climate change vulnerabilities more, uh, it's a lot of times are overlooked. Uh, so I'll try to mention in some of these, but before that I have another area where uh, we can see in uh, the, the public sector can be uh, related, which is in the implementation of the REDD plus uh, projects and activities. So that, that's a big area. Uh, in both public and private sector, we see uh, the um, climate research uh, fraud is one area of corruption. Um, well, uh, on in terms of whistleblowers, uh, I, you know, I'm moving from areas to areas. In terms of whistleblowers, uh, we see a lot of corruption happening. Sorry for that music. Uh, happening uh, in terms of silencing uh, in, in the whistleblowers in various ways through bribery, through uh, uh, you know threatening and all that, or maybe uh, putting uh, in 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 policies and all that. Um, now going back to the um, uh, strongly on the on the on the private sector, I would like to mention the energy companies' behavior. Uh, uh, fraud is happening there, bribery influencing or buying the policymakers, and then also buying the media, the researchers as well, and. Uh, the, uh, which relates also to the multinational companies and their behaviors and the lack of accountability in that regard. And uh, my last two points uh, where we see a big uh, fraud in uh, carbon credits scheme, more commonly known as carbon trading, and also the carbon tax fraud. But as I mentioned, uh, if, if we look into the uh, Transparency International's um, uh, you know, case at last, we will find a huge list of uh, some of these there as well. And uh, another, it, it relates to both public and private and their relationship, and also in terms of uh, you know, uh, small uh, areas of uh, private sector, which is the government subsidies, because the government subsidies are given uh, uh, to mitigate and for adaptation of uh, climate change, but uh, we see that these subsidies are abused or misused in the private sector. So that is another area. Now my third point, I don't know how much time I have already taken up. Uh, my third point is um, 
the areas that I think can be strengthened to address these, what I have just said. Firstly, uh, two multinational areas. One is the CVF, the Climate Vulnerable Forum. Uh, I think there is a need for uh, initializing discussion on the relationship of uh, climate change and how it is rendering vulnerabilities in terms of, uh, sorry, corruption, and how it is impacting the vulnerability in terms of climate change. So that is because it's a forum of most vulnerable countries. So this is a place I think where we can initiate a discussion. And uh, secondly, uh, I think uh, that is, I know that it is a little bit, uh, not little bit, uh, quite a bit challenging, but still we need to keep it in mind how we can incorporate in the work of uh, conference of parties of UNFCCC. Now, let me uh, take a look into UNCAC provisions. Uh, you know, where we have Article 1.B and Chapter 4, the whole Chapter 4, that talks about provisions for international cooperation. I think there are a lot of areas that needs to be implemented, not only for climate change, but also for other areas. But I think that um, there are a number of areas that can be in implemented in the climate change uh, vulnerability area. Uh, secondly, um, uh, particularly, I will focus on the international cooperation, which has a big uh, point in UN uh, UNCAC, but we don't see much of it coming up. Um, first thing to mention, if you look at the situation of climate financing, uh, you know, as per 2019-2020, um, US dollar 632 billion US dollar was required for climate financing, but which is not there. And then we look into what happened uh, in the Paris Agreement and follow uh, in the follow up of the Paris Agreement, the world community agreed that there will be um, 100 billion US dollars uh, going to the developing countries. And we have not yet seen that coming up uh, so far, uh, but it, I, I would say it has a huge impact and I would relate it to more to the ethical and moral questions that we are dealing with today. And um, third point is uh, looking at the articles 12, 21, 22 and others also uh, to be strengthened in terms of realization so that can have the impact with in, in terms of climate change as well. My fourth point is to much more to be done in terms of accountability in the operation of multinational and transnational companies. And if we look into the chapter five of UNCAC, we will see, um, and also another point uh, that we see in chapter five in terms of asset recovery. Uh, I think uh, we, we can uh, take a look uh, and there is a need for exploring or if needs be expanding it to link with the loss and damage question in terms of climate change. Uh, uh, in a way like corruption impacting climate change, corruption happening in one country, impacting the uh, climate change in other vulnerable countries should be able to be compensated for uh, most uh, vulnerable uh, countries. Now, nationally, if we look into, we need to include in the national anti-corruption uh, strategies and mechanism, the, um, the area of climate change. Uh, in Bangladesh, we have something in general that has been introduced very recently, which we call national integrity strategy. And that relates a lot of moral ethical questions and also it relates to the corruption issue. I think climate change needs to be included there. Uh, my third point is um, uh, the anti-corruption tools to be added uh, as we have done in REDD Red uh, Plus. We have seen it in Bhutan, Bangladesh has done it and also uh, in Philippines. In Bangladesh, uh, we, we have um, added the uh, corruption risk assessment component since 2012. Uh, and fourthly, rebuilding the uh, rebuilding in the rebuilding stage, we need to address corruption. Uh, rebuilding after the disaster, any kind of disaster, because it also has uh, the it, if it is not sustainable, if it is not environment free, then it has also impact on the uh, uh, vulnerability of the increasing the vulnerability of the climate change. And I stop here. But I would like to end uh, with uh, a quotation from uh, the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, uh, Prime Minister of Bangladesh, um, Sheikh Hasina. Uh, I quote, Bangladesh is often referred to 
as the ground zero for adverse impacts of climate change. Despite our vulnerabilities and resource constraints, we have adopted exemplary initiatives to tackle climate change, unquote. I mention this because corruption is one of such areas which we have added in our actions, which we call some of the exemplary actions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks to you, Ambassador. Um, uh, quite a holistic an overview on the relationship between climate change and uh, corruption. Um, uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom and also for some uh, suggestions that you have shared. Now, continuing with the agenda, uh, allow me to introduce, uh, introduce Mr. Belisario Contreras, Senior Director at Global Security and Technology Strategy, Venable former uh, and also former Security Program Manager at the OAS, OAS Organization of American States. If I can properly uh, mention that um, he possesses a deep understanding of international legislative and policy making processes involving information technology and cybersecurity. He has also uh, fostered fruitful partnerships with various stakeholders throughout his career, including high level government officials, the private sector and civil society representatives. Mr. Contreras is highly experienced in designing, managing and monitoring international cooperation projects as well. As I mentioned, he previously served as the manager head of uh, the Organization of American States Cyber Security Program of a uh, great reputation throughout the Americas and beyond. And in this position, he spearheaded their strategic partnerships with key international actors and positioned the organization's program as a leading initiative on cyber capacity building issues across the Americas and the world. With that introduction, allow me to offer the floor to Mr. Contreras. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And um, it's an honor to be here with uh, these distinguished panelists and this distinguished Spanish, uh, audience today. Uh, hello from, from Washington, D.C. Um, this, this morning. Um, well, I'm, I'm here, I'm pleased to, to be here this morning today to share a little bit of, of what's going on in the cybersecurity world. Um, as Secretary General Guterres and everyone, I, I will say, acknowledge cybersecurity has, became, has become a, an issue of, of top priority. Um, and I will say um, this has happened for over a decade. Uh, nevertheless, um, when the COVID-19 pandemic started, this issue became of um, notorious uh, or very notorious for, for the common user, for the common citizen. Uh, this was due to the need of telework, to the reliance on ICTs and to the increase of cyber incidents to key critical infrastructure systems, including the healthcare, um, which of course um, makes our, our life more dependent of technologies and cybersecurity uh, again became uh, a top priority for governments. Um, I was actually want to, to mention something that Robert uh, Barron to mention about global emergencies. Cybersecurity is also uh, tied uh, nowadays to global emergencies. Um, this morning, uh, actually at Davos, uh, there was a panel saying that now we are living in a hybrid war. Um, and you have seen the conflict in Ukraine, everything besides what's going on on, on the ground. It is actually, there has been a, a digital war. There has been attacks to to the, to the government, there has been a uh, huge misinformation uh, campaign towards um, everything that is going on from like from Russia. Um, so this is something that, that is really important to consider. Besides that, um, just uh, two weeks ago, about two weeks ago, President Rodrigo Chavez, uh, the newly elected president of Costa Rica, for the first time uh, in a Latin American country and probably many countries around the world, he declared national emergency. Although national emergencies were very common because of, like, because of COVID-19 pandemic 
this was the first time that it was declared because of cyber attack. Um, the interesting thing here about the Costa Rica incidents is that uh, it was um, declared the two uh, attacks that uh, were happened um, from, from the Conti Hacker Group, which is a, a hacker organization with uh, close ties uh, to Kremlin. Um, one of the interesting uh, comments or responses from President Chavez in Costa Rica is that the Central American country today is at war. Um, and for the, all of you uh, who are not aware, Costa Rica is a country that for about 70 years uh, has abolished its army and is one of the most peaceful countries around the world. So its declarations and these implications have, of course, notorious implications at the international law and at the whole UN system. Um, so cyber is, is now, I would say, permeated all national and international issues. This week or a few days ago, also, there was a huge breach of confidentiality involving Peruvian um, citizens. Um, this was something disclosed by the Peruvian Bank Association, and the and the Prime Minister actually was called to update its its national cybersecurity strategy. We are seeing uh, upcoming elections this weekend in Colombia, where again. Uh, things related to misinformation uh, has been brought up, and not only in Colombia, but in many other countries in Latin America and around the world. This is something that is it's, it's persistent. So what, what should be the response? Um, as Ambassador Nahida Sohan said, it, this is something that needs to be comprehensive, that we need a public-private uh, partnership response, all these uh, incidents or all these attacks and all these events need a cohesive and a comprehensive approach. For this, um, the government cannot act alone, companies cannot act alone, and the civil society cannot act alone. We need a cohesive approach to cybersecurity and we need to build better policies, sounding regulation. We need to have aligned and harmonize uh, legislation, uh, both at the regional and the international level. We, second, need to increase our information sharing. Uh, regional and international level, we need to make sure that um, computer security, emergency response teams, law enforcement agencies, and policymakers share their information and best practices on how to better tackle um, cybersecurity threats both regionally and internationally. And third, we need to have a better informed um, civil society. For that, we need to, to make sure that there are awareness and uh, awareness raising programs in place. Most of the countries are still uh, around the world, they don't have dedicated awareness raising programs. And we still don't have uh, educated uh, civil society, we don't, still don't have an educated end user, and this needs to, to change. Cybersecurity or digital security, digital literacy needs to be uh, as basic and, and needs to be embedded in all uh, educational curriculum. Um, I will be glad to, to continue with the dialogue in, in the discussion. And once again, Alex, Lucia, many thanks for your kind invitation. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Contreras, uh, for highlighting uh, this part um, of the linkages uh, with corruption and technology, uh, cybersecurity and fraud and so on. Uh, your experience is indeed uh, very obvious to us, and I thank you again. Uh, now, we will um, watch a video from the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of UNITAR, Ambassador Luis Gallegos, uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Ecuador, and a long um, uh, outstanding uh, diplomat uh, in a career that spans uh, 40 some years in several capacities, ambassador to the White House, ambassador to, if I may finish, thank you, ambassador to the White House, ambassador to the United Nations in New York, ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva, 
and very many other things. And today, not only the chairman of our um, UN agency, but also the chairman of the Global uh, Initiative on Aging. Aging, of course, uh, being one of the priorities of our time and age. Uh, with that introduction, allow me uh, now to give the floor uh, virtually to Ambassador Luis Gallegos. This initiative has an opportunity to, to, to stay stuck, to take stock on current challenges created or worsened by corruption acts. Covering causes and consequences from a, co a contemporary literacy perspective makes visible the links with the global financial system, climate change, lawlessness of cybersecurity, and peace and security as a whole. As you know, corruption can be present in different forms and nuances everywhere. Therefore, raising awareness, empowering people, and fostering positive mindsets for combating corruption is essential. In an age where people can access, manage, and evaluate information, the ways of educating them have to be changed accordingly. In this endeavor, information and communication technologies can play an important role to access, manage, and evaluate data, developing new understandings, as well as communicating with others to participate effectively in society. As technology enables learning to extend beyond the classroom walls and facilitates better access to learning resources, the tools of technology altered the way individuals learn. We must need to make sure that data is working for us, not against us. In this regard, I would like to highlight the role of education in anti-corruption faced through the five emergencies raised by the UN Secretary General at the beginning of this year. COVID-19 brought a number of impacts worldwide by deepening pre-existing inequalities and exposing vulnerabilities at social, political, and economical levels. It caused the, shut, the shutdown of schools, businesses, workplaces, etc., and forced millions to stay at home <coughs> for extended lengths of time. In this situation, technology became one essential resource for people to continue with some activities and cope the pandemic. As it became an integral part of our lives, it also facilitated the transformation of contemporary literacy. The pandemic also triggered the need to digitalize processes while promoting transparency, access to information amid optimized time. The lack of digitalization of private and public systems turned out as a challenge in adapting to the technological transformation of work like uh, work life during uh, COVID-19. It caused difficulties in dealing with the risk of corruption. On one hand, employers had to adapt to the new technology-based work working environment and train, and train their employees to this while preventing any risk of corruption. On the other hand, the employees also had to adapt to the new environment. In some cases, they had to improve their skills in contemporary literacy to keep their jobs and networks. About the global financial system, it has repercussions on those who are directly and indirectly involved, meaning all. It can either facilitate or preclude corruption when it, becomes, when it comes to legal agreements, institutions, and economic actors related to international flow of financial capitals for purposes of investment and trade financing regulation and policies. A better understanding of, in this regard is essential to raise awareness and promote access to information that may avoid undesirable impacts on, at individual and collective levels because of lack of transparency. Ladies and gentlemen, governmental regulations on climate change should be unbreakable to corruption, risks for avoiding future environmental damages and resource overuse. Digital education is a powerful means to raise awareness in this regard. In the same vein, knowledge on cybersecurity is indeed needed to protect critical systems and sensitive information from digital attacks. In this era where almost everyone experiences digital tools from making transactions to digital investment, educating internet users about cybersecurity is essential to maintain a safe, reliable, and corruption-free environment. 
The lack of effective international legal instruments in the cyberspace has been heavily debated in theoretical and policy-making debates due to its complexity. It has been challenged to achieve specific binding agreements. First of all, the advance in technology to the levels of new discoveries every day, the advancement of artificial intelligence, make it explicitly difficult to legislate immediate responses to this ever-arching issue of a dynamic and, and, very, and very powerful force that is being used at a lightning speed. Finally, I would like to highlight that corruption is acknowledged as a worldwide threat to peace and security. In most cases, a lack of peace and security is accompanied by a high level of corruption. In countries that are insufficient in providing peace and security for their citizens, contemporary literacy holds promise. By enabling communicating easily with others and sharing information, enhanced contemporary literacy plays a role to fight corruption through collaborative actions. When we talk about literacy, we talk about the knowledge of ITC use and in this world of information and communication technology, where the, where the spread of the social media is one of the phenomenons that will affect and will continue to affect our lives and the way we carry on our lives and the way governments and institutions work. In these, we should always, uh, we should always have a priority on the safe being of the human being, the, uh, the issue of uh, having uh, corruption as a level of containment that we need in all aspects of our lives. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Excellency. Thank you, Ambassador uh, Gallegos, um, for uh, sharing remarks and taking the time uh, to record this video from Boston. Ambassador Gallegos is uh, currently um, at Harvard University as part of, of the leadership initiative of uh, that um, academic center. Now, um, we have a, a two things to share before we go to the Q&A. Um, uh, can you just put the cover, of, of, uh, if I may, Ana Lucia and colleagues? Um, our colleague Anaste Anastasia Nesvetianova um, from UNTAD is still trying to connect. Uh, we, I, I think she's uh, traveling and having some uh, connectivity issues, but we have uh, someone instead. Uh, thank you, that, that's the agenda, and, and stay there. In, in the cover. Um, we have uh, some, someone instead that we greatly appreciate and admire, uh, Professor Evru Kanan Sokulu, uh, who has connected um, from uh, Turkey. She is a member of the faculty of uh, BAU uh, Global uh, Network of Universities and uh, Bashe Heshir uh, University in Istanbul, and also the director of uh, CIFAL Istanbul, an international training center for authorities and leaders. Uh, Professor Evru Kanan, as a, an academician, understand the role of academia um, when it comes to capacity building and, and corruption. And I wanted to present to you, uh, Professor Kanan Sokulu, if you could give us some comments um, and collect the camera, perhaps if you can. Um, let me ask you this question. What should be the role of academia in this holistic approach to corruption that we are trying to portray here? Welcome, Evru. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if everything is in perfect order. Um, well, it's a great pleasure for me to hear with all the colleagues and the experts uh, on anti-corruption, which has become uh, one of the most important problems related to the academia and the role of academia, particularly in, uh, in conveying information and the awareness, um, particularly concerning the ethical issues when it comes to data sharing, uh, on some minorities, particularly, which are the underprivileged groups that have been affected very much by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And if I can just wrap up my thoughts um, in a couple of uh, points that will be, I think, uh, helpful for, um, you know, the, the discussion uh, that we will have in, in today. So one of the things actually uh, that relate to academia in terms of corruption is, of course, COVID-19 changed the norms and uh, COVID-19 sharpened all these issues related to diversity and unity 
and particularly in an environment where uh, the, the education uh, became more global. There are no boundaries. We have actually uh, witnessed uh, the very increased advanced use of technology uh, in some parts of the world where the technology facilitated education. And in other parts of the uh, world, which actually technology was not available, so that there had been serious interruptions in the education. And that had actually be uh, a serious interruption for the way that, um, you know, the um, academia uh, had difficulties in, in teaching and educating. And also um, particularly related to the issues, you know, um, in the theme of corruption, um, the norms and the themes have become very diverse. And for instance, if you consider human mobility, right? Um, COVID-19 provided a serious problem for uh, some groups like refugees, uh, immigrants, and this actually made uh, things even worse for them when it comes to providing equal and equitable education. So I, I would like to give um, you know these brief information about uh, how academia was uh, you know um, impacted with the corruption during and after the COVID nineteen period, and so that also be, you know getting access to the resources to carry out research. So um, you know well social sciences use technology very frequently, and. Um, but in, in natural sciences um, and for the disciplines, for the research fields, which require all these facilities and the laboratories and applied, you know, teaching um, was um, a very problematic for the training. And also, um, well, I think we have not discussed and but in academia, we have been discussing very seriously is when it comes to corruption, the evaluation of student performances and successes. Um, we did all these uh, evaluations as equal and, and, and just as possible with our students. But of course, uh, concerning the ethical considerations about like, for instance, plagiarism or, you know, originality in the work that we expect from students um, to, to excel their studies, this has become a serious problem for the academic quality of um, evaluations. I don't know if I should add more, Alex, um, maybe I don't want to distract too much, but um, to wrap up, academia was impacted um, on two levels. The first level was actually how to evaluate um, in a just way the performances and how to carry out uh, the research uh, particularly the applied research uh, during uh, the COVID-19 era. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to you, Professor Kanan Sokulu. Uh, very important to understand uh, what has happened in academia and the role of academia in this important topic. So um, uh, let me now go uh, to the next part of this uh, conference. It's exactly, thank you for time management, it's exactly 11. Uh, AM uh, here in Geneva, one hour into these two hours that uh, we have allotted today. And let me now open for the second part of this first session of the conference, the Q&A, questions and answers. And I would like to present the first one to Professor Barrington, who gave us a, 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 an excellent view, a holistic overview of this issue. So if you can put um, his picture uh, again, uh, that would be very good. And I will be reading the question for you, Professor uh, Barrington, if you can help us. Uh, a participant asked the following. What about if the system is already corrupted uh, to a point and for so long um, with the same uh, people on the top of the pyramid or the same uh, political party ideology or affiliation uh, ruling? Uh, if this is the case, how should we deal uh, with these issues and how should we manage crisis, financial or non financial? Um, so we can survive. Uh, thank you, the person says. So let's stop uh, sharing the screen and let's uh, uh, allow Professor Barrington to speak and uh, so we can show his, his uh, face. What should we do, Professor uh, uh, Barrington, in this scenario? The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, um, I mean, it's a fantastic question because this is a classic um, problem in tackling corruption. 
that if corruption is about the abuse of power, which it generally is, um, uh, how do those people without power, who are the victims of corruption, um, respond to the abuse of power by those who hold power? Um, and there are some well-known um, mechanisms to respond to that. But overall, I have to say, the picture is quite gloomy uh, because um, generally the people who hold power like to keep it. Um, and uh, often they will use whatever mechanisms they can to keep it, uh, including promoting corruption, if that helps their cause, uh, including enriching themselves uh, and using uh, those uh, that wealth uh, to embed themselves in power, whether it's through um, uh, political party financing or whether it's through um, other mechanisms. Uh, so it is a problem. Um, but to look slightly more optimistically, I'll tell you what the, the known solutions are. Um, and obviously, in different political contexts, they may or may not apply. Uh, the first one is um, clearly in uh, a situation where citizens are able to um, uh, influence those in power, usually through elections. Uh, then citizens can make their voices heard um, through the electoral process. That often does not work. So it is something that works uh, sometimes, but not always. Um, there are many examples of where it has worked very well. Um, and uh, highly corrupt governments um, have actually been put out of office. Um, there are um, also examples of citizens uh, taking power into their own hands. Um, uh, since the world's focused on uh, Ukraine, we can't ignore the, uh, the Maidan revolution in Ukraine um, and others that have happened around the world, broadly peaceful revolutions where citizens have taken to the streets and said, we have had enough. Um, so, you know, it, political and electoral processes can be part of the solution here. But as governments are threatened, they can become more um, more hardline and more repressive. Uh, so that can create danger for the citizens. There are two other well-known mechanisms. The first is external pressure, uh, that sometimes a government um, uh, or those in power will be um, uh, happily um, operating in a corrupt way. But external pressure from uh, other countries or other uh, or the international community uh, will cause them to, to temper, uh, if not entirely um, uh, stop um, those behaviours, at least to moderate those behaviours. So external pressure, um, whether through United Nations or elsewhere, can be extremely important. Again, um, it depends. External pressure on very large countries and very powerful countries uh, has less effect than external pressure on uh, other countries. We know that. Uh, finally, we come to the very interesting questions around transparency. What role can transparency play here? And transparency um, has got to a revolution recently. Uh, in the last 30 years, um, the opportunities for transparency have absolutely uh, exploded because um, of social media. Uh, it is more possible for citizens to know what is happening in their country than ever before. Uh, that's one of the reasons why certain governments try to uh, prevent the flows of information through social media, because they see it as a threat. But transparency can be very important. That can be uh, transparency proactively from government and companies, um, publishing information through things like the Open Government Partnership or the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. It can be sort of self-generated transparency through social media, for example, where abuses of power are um, uh, exposed. We're having an interesting uh, example in the UK, for example, uh, of um, a government um, which has broken its own COVID regulations on lockdown, having parties in the seat of government. Um, and this has been broadly exposed by journalists and social media. So alongside uh, social media, the role of journalism uh, is absolutely critical. And again, that can be journalists within the country or outside the country. Uh, once citizens know what is happening um, through this transparency, it doesn't automatically lead to um, uh, a reduction in corruption, but it gives you a more favourable circumstance in which corruption can be tackled because the information is available. Uh, so you have um, a combination of uh, electoral mechanisms, voluntary mechanisms by governments, external pressure and transparency uh, in different mixes in different countries. 
but you know the 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 pessimist would say they don't always work the optimist would say yes but they do sometimes work sorry i was muted uh, uh, thank you so much for those comments and uh, just as a follow up uh, very, very shortly um, uh, thank you for focusing on transparency uh, as a whole um, I know we know of your role uh, in Transparency International. Can you just add a few comments on Transparency International work in this field as a whole, if I may, Professor Barry? Yes, uh, and also not just Transparency International, but perhaps civil society more generally. Um, the Transparency International, uh, many will know, is an international anti-corruption pro-transparency organization that operates in around 100 countries. Um, in some countries, it's more or less the only um, anti-corruption uh, organization for civil society. Uh, in some countries, um, like India, for example, there are thriving anti-corruption organizations, many, many of them, um, groups of citizens who have come together um, in, uh, in civil society organizations. Um, I think the role of um, civil society is absolutely critical in these things. W one thing we know about um, uh, victims of corruption is they often feel very lonely and very isolated, that they feel as though they are the victims of an abuse of power, there's nothing that they can do about it, um, those in power have all the uh, control. Uh, civil society or groups of citizens um, allow people to come together um, and they can both promote transparency, um, so when, when transparency has been um, uh, made, um, it has been facilitated by government, for example, through publishing government data, groups of citizens can look and interpret the data. What, what does this mean about um, our daily lives? What does this tell us about um, uh, the way our country is operating? So groups can do that often better than individuals. They can use the, the data. Um, but also, um, uh, I mentioned um, investigative journalists as uh, means through which information comes in the public domain. Civil society are often very good at awareness raising more generally. Um, so my colleague from Turkey mentioned the important role of um, academia in awareness raising, particularly in training the next generation, um, which is really important, I think. Uh, civil society, of course, can reach those who don't go to university um, and uh, help raise awareness amongst those citizens. And finally, I think a very important role here um, is that uh, precisely because as an individual victim of corruption, you're very vulnerable, um, civil society can be your advocate. So if you are a victim of corruption, and this is a role often played by Transparency International, you, you may not feel confident to go through the legal system or to go to a government department, which you've had a problem with, but civil society can go on your behalf. And if you go as part of an organization and not just an individual, you yourself have a little bit more power. So the balance of power gets redressed. So civil society, in my mind, is a critical part of this um, mix. And Transparency International is probably the best known global anti-corruption organization with its chapters in 100 countries. But there are many other really fantastic civil society organizations thriving uh, in uh, Latin America, in Africa, in Asia in particular, um, which really help um, give a voice and, and protection to citizens. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and yes, um, civil society as a whole and very many examples of the role of civil society in ensuring and promoting transparency, but indeed uh, still Transparency International Organization is a role model to follow and uh, we at the United Nations are greatly respect that and um, uh, we respect as well your role in the leadership of this organization. We have received another question uh, for you, Professor Barrington, but let me go through the speakers and I will come back to you if I may. Now, I would like to uh, present a question to Ambassador uh, Sobhan. Ambassador Sobhan um, is an expert on human rights, uh, climate change, and uh, you already heard um, uh, the way she thinks. Well, there is a question, Ambassador, on the next generation and what our generation should do to empower them. So uh, as you uh, show us and, and mention some linkages between uh, climate change um, uh, and, and corruption proper and the role of uh, or behavior of several actors, including the private sector. Let me ask you, Ambassador, what in practical terms, um, the question is, what should we do to empower the next generation to take the mantle as early as possible to defend 
uh, climate change protect the planet at the same time they fight the corruption in this field. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Um, I, let me just uh, move a little bit outside the question, just to tell you that actually I, I think I'm learning more from the other panelists than uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, share my ideas as well. Uh, with regard to your question, I think the youth has a huge uh, role to play. But uh, sometimes, as I say, that it, it is not only about financial issues, but also the ethical and moral issues. And I would think, I would say that perception carries a lot in this time. I give you an example why I talk about perception. When we were talking about, we just had um, Barrington, I think, mentioned about uh, the, the um, you know, private sector or uh, funding the political parties or influencing them in many ways and influencing the policies in many ways. Uh, in that, uh, I would say why I'm linking it with perception. If a business community or the private sector, when they are trying to invest in the political parties or influence the policies, it's like an investment for them. They don't see it from that ethical point of view of uh, putting it into the definition of corruption. If you ask them, they will say it's an investment for them for their ensuring their future. But this perception uh, that it is actually what we say corruption, it's not, you know, ethical investment. Uh, in that way, I think that the youth has a strong role to play. Education has a strong role to play. We have had uh, Professor Ebru. Uh, and I do believe education has a really strong role to play uh, to, to, you know, build or if, if I can say rebuild uh, the, the uh, moral and ethical perspective of a human being. Uh, for the youth, uh, they can work on um, raising awareness. Uh, they can work in forums working both with the government for raising awareness, but as well as with the private sector and other stakeholders, as well as the victims. I give you an example in other sector, not here, not in, in terms of climate change. Um, in, in Bangladesh, there was a huge campaign by the government uh, to stop uh, child marriage. And while uh, engaging with the youth, what we found later that in many areas, many, um, you know, more areas that are more in a vulnerable or marginalized situation, the youth, local youth, formed sort of a forum or a club. And whenever they listen or hear, you know, that there is going to be a child getting married and everything or being forced to, they would show up. You know, they would show up preventing that even, and then they would, uh, you know, hand uh, the parents or others involved uh, to the police. So this this has been a strong, uh, interesting, uh, you know, mechanism, but it grew up on its own. I have a huge faith on youth because I have very uh, quite young two children. Uh, so I have a huge faith on youth and I, I believe that they can uh, build their own mechanism. We don't have to show them the way if they're wanting to. And second point is, if you look at the youth, uh, they are the future, uh, both employers and employees, and they will be entering the workforce. And if they are strong in their ethical sense, they, they, their sense can, uh, you know, be instilled into their work. And, you know, it becomes uh, in, a, in a greater uh, workforce and it becomes in a greater work field, job market as well. Thank you. Thanks to you. And just a follow-up question George received uh, from the floor, from the participants. I'm going to read it to you, Ambassador. It says, uh, whilst, uh, while I understand it might be beyond the scope of this seminar, it would be perhaps be very interesting to approach the subject from a behavioral psychological standpoint, i.e. how small albeit unconscious acts of corruption might escalate and lead to systemic degradation of the very foundations of government and civil society. As you are a successful um, uh, public sector official, a senior diplomat, 
I believe you are very well equipped, uh, equipped to give us some comments on, on, on these things. Uh, so Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I, I fully agree. I fully agree about the psychological makeup. Uh, but uh, in, in recent years, what we see that uh, a lot of environment, uh, what we have, I mean, what is the buildup of a psychology? You know, some uh, genetics, some uh, inherent and some coming from environment. And when you have an, in general, a challenging environment, when somebody is living in an in a challenging environment, the psychological makeup becomes more uh, challenging. Or, or the psychological structure becomes more challenging. Nowadays, we see a lot of mental health issues coming out of frustrations and all that. But I think uh, early childhood and at the primary level is a good uh, place to intervene for creating a psychological makeup. And uh, institutionally speaking, uh, that's why I mentioned that in Bangladesh, uh, we very recently have a um instilled um, a, a strategy a program which we called NIS national integrity strategy and it is very much in the public sector and uh, for that we have created uh, within the uh, government sector some accountability in the system some transparency in the system but also uh, you know reporting back so it, it depends, uh, it, it is uh, and, and not just encouraging, but it is upon all the ministries. It's, it has become like a, a rule regulation. It, it is upon all the ministries to report back on the integrity issue, on the transparency and accountability issue. Uh, it is in the, still in the makeup uh, stage. Uh, it, it's, it's still in the process, but it, it's a, a good way to look at it, uh, in the, particularly in the, in the public sector and how to instill it in the, in the mind of the people. Not, you know, sometimes I fully agree that it doesn't actually always depend on what rules, regulations or laws you have on hand. Uh, corruption is something that uh, sometimes come out of your mind, you know how 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 you look at things the ethical sense the moral sense is very much uh, attached to it thank you uh, thanks to you indeed um i, I sincerely appreciate all the comments uh, from the panelists let me now invite um to present the next questions invite mr Belicerio contreras uh, to address them if i may mr contreras we have received two uh, questions uh, quite interesting one one of, of them of course from the point of view of technology, an area in which you are very well versed. It says, um, if we take, for instance, um, a medical supply organization given the authority by the government to supply the country with medical equipments um, and other things during a crisis, um, please uh, give us your opinions on the following. If during the pandemic, these organizations ends up with a corruption case because of the pressure to uh, procure and to buy uh, goods under a time, uh, a short uh, time frame. Should we blame the government for the genetical case of this organization or should we prevent it uh, utilizing leveraging te technology? Mr. Contreras. Thank you. No, thank you, Alex. I, I, there is no excuse for corruption uh, like, uh, yeah, period. Uh, it doesn't matter like what is the, the emergency, there is, there is just no excuse. Um, during COVID-19, there were many emergency, of course, there, there were, everything was a, an emergency, and everything has been a, an emergency. Um, um, the, uh, like the laws and the regulations are in place and we need to abide. Um, that, that that's what it's if, if we don't if we don't follow the rule of law uh tomorrow is one a small thing uh, to, today is one small thing tomorrow is going to be a, a big thing so the, the basic question is is no we we should not be allow room for for any doubt of of, of it um i do i do believe that um governments and the private sector should work uh, to better find a procurement mechanism to make sure that um, that the end user can benefit from technology 
and that government institutions can become more efficient on the on the use of technology. And, and there are really good examples like in the United States, in the United Kingdom, uh, countries like Chile, Colombia, they are already implementing uh, these best practices on how to, to do these uh, procurement, procurement programs where you can basically access to, to these hardware, software, or technology um, services that, that specific governments may need, uh, no matter how big uh, or how small you, you need them in, in a scale. But uh, once again, there should not be ever room for to, to allow and to prove corruption. Uh, indeed, uh, there is no, uh, there is zero tolerance, and there has to be zero tolerance uh, for corruption, as you correctly saw, even though um, leveraging technology indeed uh, can help us to prevent some of it. But there is a second question for you, Mr. Contreras, if I may read. Uh, quite interesting, it's about um, uh, personal liberties and, uh, of course, the right that we all have to our own. Uh, oh, welcome to our colleague Anastasia. Nesvetailova. <laughs> we are very happy that you are with us, uh, Diana Anastasia. I'm yeah. really sorry. Yeah, there was a. Um, That's quite all right. It your happens. colleagues did heroic efforts to connect me. So I'm really sorry. I blame That's it on. That's all right. But we are very happy that you're here. And I will give you the floor for your presentation very soon. But just to finish this first round of, of questions, and now to Mr. Contreras, I had another uh, question on uh, the right to privacy. Uh, and in this day and age, of course, um, what's happening with technology. It, it says uh, sometimes other type of corruption is when someone access um, lawfully uh, your personal information and distribute that uh, freely. What should we do about it? Um, it of course, if you have nothing to hide uh, still, uh, it's a violation of your rights uh, to privacy. But now we have seen the case of uh, the Panama Papers and uh, very many other issues like that, the WikiLeaks and so on, hacking into accounts, in this case government, but also personal and sharing that information. So we have two sides to that. If you can give us some comments, uh, Mr. Contreras, on the right to privacy, but at the same time, the right of society to know when someone is going wrong. Mr. Contreras. Definitely, definitely. That um, there is a due process. Uh, for, for everything is a, a due process and I'm not, not, I'm not gonna justify like the action of uh, any, any particular company or any particular individual. Um, but one thing is one thing, like privacy is a, an universal right. And if we, again, if we don't abide for those rules that are like internationally accepted, today it's uh, like, it, like just a, a small window, uh, tomorrow basically all our privacy will be exposed. That said, um, like there should be strict controls on what companies and what certain government officials should be allowed to do. Um, again, um, we should not shield on our privacy rights uh, to do wrong things or to do things that are not good like for the society or to, you know, to commit crimes. Um, my rights go until your rights uh, affect yours, right? So, so yeah, um, it's, it's of course uh, an interesting dilemma, but again, privacy, it's, it's something that, that we should be very careful to care about. Um, there are specific laws both in Europe, in the Americas, in any specific countries, and that's that's just a fundamental right um, that we that we need to to keep protecting and that we need to keep promoting um, towards the world. Um, nevertheless, we need to actually make sure that we have uh, more accountable standards and regulations to to make sure that incidents that the ones that have been, again, publicly exposed, uh, continue happening. Uh, the ones that you mentioned is just one, but there are many others that have occurred that probably we don't are not aware, and probably there will be others that uh, will be uh, keep on occurring. Indeed, uh, thank you for sharing those comments. Um, let me um, uh, now uh, make two announcements. And um, uh, for those of you 
uh, that have uh, uh, joined after uh, the formal opening. Uh, let me say that this uh, conference, the first part of this conference, this first session, it's uh, uh, trying to go deeper and, uh, in our understanding of the links between uh, anti-corruption and uh, contemporary literacy, our, our understanding of the world and the priorities that we have now and in the future. And the five global emergencies that our United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has uh, postulated not only for the UN system and for all of us, UN agencies and UN staff members, but as an invitation for governments and the whole of society to understand what are really the priorities ahead in the, this so-called post-pandemic era. In that sense, we had a holistic overview uh, by Professor Barrington on the what happened with uh, corruption in crisis. Uh, we also heard uh, from Ambassador Sobhan on climate change and corruption. We heard from Mr. Contreras on cybersecurity and corruption. And we heard uh, properly on literacy, capacity building, and anti-corruption from Ambassador uh, Gallegos. Now, we are very happy uh, to have uh, to talk on the global financial crisis and corruption. Uh, our, our colleague, Ms. Anastasia Nesbeta-Ilova, who is the head of Microeconomic and Development Policies Branch at UNTA, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, and our dearest uh, partners and sister agency uh, here in Geneva, the Palais de Nations. So without further ado, allow me to offer the floor to our colleague, Anastasia. Welcome. Hey, you're muted. Uh, you're muted, Anastasia. <laughs> Yeah. I apologize for all the technical connections. Thank you for the welcome. Uh, I wonder if I can share my screen because I have a small PowerPoint presentation. If it's a problem, I can just speak. Um, I can I can speak on my own. Okay, so this will be this, and let's try to um, to 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 to. <clears throat> it says enter in a screen sharing mode, but I think it's not. I'm showing. frozen. Yes. Yeah. Can you disconnect? I'm and frozen. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. I, just, I just guess to you, have... you make it a slideshow, so it's bigger. I click on the slideshow. Thank you. Click on the slideshow. At and the bottom I... right. At the bottom right. At the bottom of PowerPoint to the right, you see that exactly. The slideshow is the one to the right, I think. Did it not? To the right, to the right, to the, that, that one. Voila. Yes, okay, perfect. Go ahead, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the time. So uh, I am in my double hat today as both um, chief of uh, macroeconomic department here at UNCTAD. But previously, I was a professor at university, and part of my professorial job was, of course, to write books and do research. So my latest monograph uh, was called Sabotage, the Business of Finance. I have co-written it with Professor Ruben Falan, who happens to be my husband. It's convenient. And we were investigating um, uh, really the, the broader impact of the significance of everything we have seen during the financial crisis and in the immediate um, aftermath, but also broadly in the historical evolution of the financial system. So these are the lessons I will be talking to you about today, uh, not only, but primarily the research, my, my research has always been on finance and banks. Um, it's partly to do uh, with corruption or usually in, in finance it's called illicit financial flows. And of course, my point about illicit financial flows would be always to, um, in an example, for example, when a lot of regulators or policemen or state officials um, or governance institutions want to fight um, either illicit, illicit financial flows from emerging markets or particular developing economies, I will always point out that they are only your problem because you have enabled them through institutions and, and financial centers and financial facilities uh, and banks and financial houses that exist not only <clears throat> in the core financial centers that we're used to, New York, London, um, and for example, Frankfurt, uh, but they're 
fundamentally facilitated by the plumbing of the global financial system, but would be the offshore financial centers, the intermediaries, the enablers, uh, the legal and consulting services that, that provide uh, that particular service. But that's not the subject of the book at all. The subject of the book was uh, about how to understand the behavior um, the apparently really bad behavior of financiers and bankers and why it has become so endemic. And this is where corruption comes in. Um, corruption, of course, has a vast academic literature behind it on sociology and economics and political science in, in anthropology. And across all these academic disciplines, corruption usually tends to be uh, viewed as an outcome of poor structure of incentives. Somebody is underpaid or not paid well and therefore they abuse their position of power. A cultural or anthropological explanation for corruption, for, for the micro level of corruption, when individuals take bribes, when individuals rely on a, on a non-market um, non practice, they tend to say, well, maybe these people feel disempowered and this is, this is how they tend to participate in the political or, or social group because that's the only way they can uh, make ends meet um, or, or have their voice heard in the system. The diagnosis across all these disciplines and actually across time is we, actually... Sorry to interrupt the Anastasia. For some reason, uh, we have the presentation Frozen Technology is not helping us today. Thank you for your patience. Would you mind stopping the sharing and sharing again? I apologize for that. Would Do you want me to stop sharing and just talk? I, I can do that. Uh, stop sharing. Let's just try one last time. Or if you can, you can send it to uh, Ana Lucia while you uh, keep. Uh, if you That's can send fine. It. I can. I, I think it will be actually easier if I have it before my eyes and and talk to you as a normal very person. Good, very good. Go ahead then. Thank you. Okay. Um, so across all these disciplines, whoever they are, the diagnosis is fairly similar. Corruption is a problem of individual behavior. It's a problem of people. This is how they react to the system, the way it's set up. Um, and therefore, solutions tend to be about these individual behaviors. The solution as a whole, and it's universally accepted, um, is fairly straightforward. A system uh, would cure corruption or would eliminate incentives to be corrupt if it ensures proper rewards, i.e. if people are well paid and it's transparent, if they're rewarded by their skill and effort, if there is a transparent distribution of, of these rewards and regulations, and importantly, if there are costs. I would not take a bribe for giving a student a higher mark because I know I would lose my job for that. It's, it's a very clear structure of you know, penalties and rewards and, and the way the mechanism is supposed to work. Usually this mechanism that, that guarantees all these outcomes is assumed to be the market. The competitive market, the open market, maybe regulated market, but it's usually the market. No other system um, by consensus ha has, has achieved um, an optimal role in, in negotiating corrupt behaviors or disincentivizing corruption at individual level. Problem is, uh, and this is where our research in, into finance and banks and financial innovation gets uh, into uh, gets so important. Problem is, what if the market itself gets corrupted? What if there are in incentives or not for, for people to behave in a way as to corrupt the very rules of the system that is supposed to regulate corruption and eliminate it from, from scratch. In fact, if we look at, at the banking scandals of the past, let's say 20 years, these are the scandals were uh, done or were executed or were encouraged by people who were fantastically well paid. They were fantastically remunerated. They were well known. Their, their reputations were at stake. In some ways, their reputations thrived because of their role in, in these uh, practices that were deemed to be legal, but borderline moral or borderline corrupt. Um, and in fact, um, you cannot say that this wasn't a market system. The financial system is supposed to be the most globalized and most well-regulated market. So we started to think about why, it, why we cannot really think of banking scandals and, and banking crises and financial crisis as a series of individual failures. We, we thought about it as a systemic phenomenon with deep roots in historical constellation of really global political economy. 
And we came across the work uh, of Thorstein Veblen, who wrote in early 20th century investigating the causes of the great crash of the Wall Street, um, of the early Wall Street capitalism of the Great Depression, and who studied the, the evolution of American capitalism through the very legalized approaches to legalization of corporate behavior. It was Thorstein Veblen who made sabotage an economic concept. It wasn't a behavioral uh, problem for him. It wasn't a misbehavior by um, you know, semi-criminal uh, actors. It was re really a practice that is, was employed across the, the economic system, either by employees or by employers or by competitive business uh, or by huge business concerns, i.e. the corporations. Um, and these included maneuvers of delay, obstruction, friction, defeat, cheating, uh, actual destruction, sometimes physical destruction overnight, in order to get better of business rivals or to secure their own advantage in a particular given industry or a market. So sabotage at that time was acknowledged and understood to be a well-entrenched practice of how businesses operate. And in the book, we, we simply extended that concept to investigate at what levels does such behavior exist in the financial system. And we concluded um, that there are three main levels of um, sabotage in finance today. In fact, big finance, the big financial institutions and banks thrive and exist by sabotaging their clients, first of all. So the scandals that make it through news headlines are mostly about their clients. There were a lot of dead people who were being banked. There were a lot of dead accounts that were being banked. There were, there were millions of people who were cheated. Um, but these, this is only one side of the story. Um, there are, of course, sabotaging industrial sa sabotage within finance where institutions sabotage each other. They employ aggressive techniques, they employ um, uh, quite illicit maneuvers, they employ uh, tricks and, and inside information uh, in order to, to grab a share in, in, in the industry or the market with the ultimate aim to be very, very large. And of course, being large and very big ensures that they're immune to any regulation, they're immune from failure because they're now too big to fail and they will be saved by the state in times of crisis. And finally, at a more systemic level, and this is where size comes in, of course, huge banking houses and financial institutions do sabotage their role as a public um, um, as this, I cannot say servant of the people, they're private profit making institutions, but they do sabotage the state and the efforts to regulate um, the industry um, because there are facilities to do it and because, of course, they're not particularly um, keen to be regulated. Although I have to say, maybe we can cover it in question time. I have to say that, to be honest, the large banking and sophisticated financial institutions are so maneuvering, are so um, able to maneuver that they actually don't care about regulation, as numerous executives tell me all the time. To be honest, whatever regulation comes our way, from whichever side, I will put a team of legal specialists, financial engineers, mathematicians and consultants, and in four ways I will have a product or a practice that will bypass any regulation that comes our way. And this has been the story before the financial crisis and as we see more recently and due to the unresolved legacy of the financial crisis, it's still very much with us. Uh, the best movie, in fact, based on the true story of um, the JP Morgan as a bank, and I think it was the collapse of Lehman Brothers, um, was shot in, it was aired in, tw in 2011 and it's called Margin Call. If you, are, if you want to know how sabotage works, how financial institutions operate, just watch that movie. It's brilliantly acted, it's beautifully shot, but it also gives you the inside story of um, of the industry. And the key character that played by, by Jeremy Irons says a, a fantastic phrase that uh, applies to banking and uh, to banking and finance today. How do you survive in this industry? How do you compete? How do you make your profit? And he had three principles, be first, be smarter and cheat. And in our analysis of sabotage through history, it's these three 
um, actions or processes that ensure that that your financial institution is is on, on top of business, that it has the uh, monopoly position in the market, and of course it's untouchable by regulation or in fact rivals. What gives finance this endemic opportunity and capacity to maneuver and sabotage is the process of financial innovation. It's a it's a very uh, it, it's my personal kind of research interest, but it's a, it's a force that can never be underestimated. On the one hand, we cannot survive without this financial innovation and its products. Our life would be um, much less um, uh, useful, in fact, financialized, uh, paid, uh, convenient. It will be slower and more restrictive and, and much less inclusive. But on the other hand, financial innovation remains um, a system where information is by a priori asymmetric, where the power structure is distributed against those who are not inside the system and, and who don't do it, and those who are not the first there and therefore are not able to cheat. So financial innovation is something that needs to be taken incredibly seriously by um, regulators, by state officials, by bureaucrats, by um, those who do study corruption and, and who, who want to implement rules against it, um, because it's it's not even a double-edged sword. It's um, it's a uh, it's one of the most complex um, processes to be resolved politically, political, economically, and, and from the legal perspective. Um, what our research also suggests that corruption of the market in finance is systemic and inbuilt. It has not been resolved by the regulations that came after 2010, and they don't deny that they came. They're very, they're, they're quite uh, momentous in their reach, but they're not near enough uh, what needed to be done um, back in 2008, and in fact, they're not near enough its previous historical example of how the state actually could regulate um, a, a very privatized, very fragmented and very powerful financial industry. And I'm talking about the uh, 1936 um, PECORA report uh, as a result of the uh, huge efforts by regulators and state officials and economists at the time to uh, make sure that a Great Depression doesn't happen again in the US. So at that time, it was a very systemic, very comprehensive effort to stem sabotage in, in business, to regulate businesses themselves, to understand what they do and why these sabotaging maneuvers are in, are in fact a way, were considered to be legal and to delegalize them. Nothing like this was done now. And the stuff that was done is very, is very easy to, to bypass. Financial institutions themselves continue to thrive by sabotaging their clients. We saw it with a few recent scandals, Credit Suisse is one of them. Uh, they sabotage each other and of course the state, um, which remains understaffed, uh, slower and uh, internationally, I can say that financial industry is mostly scared by one regulator in, in the world, and the, that, that would be the US regulators. But unfortunately, um, there is very little comprehensive effort internationally to coordinate and to match the, the competence, the reach, the insight that good financial regulation requires. And one step, one important step towards minimizing the systemic corruption in finance would be to distinguish between the market, which remains a very abstract, very academic concept, and business. Business, and I mean big, big banks, big financial houses, big multinational corporations that use financial services and financial engineering to sabotage and, and to maneuver and to arbitrage and to seek power and protect themselves from scrutiny. Um, and that is a very important distinction that regulators and, and, and policymakers, need, in fact, need to make. The market is, an, is, is a market. It exists as an abstract. In real life, it's businesses, and in particular, big businesses, um, that are um, very destructive uh, in times of crisis, stress. and uh, But at the same time, they do remain powerful because we are used to 
or we are led to think that they deliver economic growth, they provide jobs, they are absolutely necessary for investment and, and globalization, which is of course partly true, um, but in the way that it's being done now, it, it, it is outside of very much the eye of public scrutiny, um, civil control, and therefore very conducive to, to existing and further corruption in the world economy. On this I will finish. Thank you very much again for listening. Yeah, thanks to you. Um, uh, uh, Professor Nesvia has um, uh, given us an overview of these five areas that we have been touching on the financial markets, the global financial crisis and its legacies and what's happening now um, in this outstanding um, uh, investigation that she has made. And I just wanted to add something. We'll go back to one last question later. Uh, if I may, Anastasia, but uh, she had published three uh, uh, impressive papers. The first one, if I uh, may mention, Fragile Finance, Debt, Speculation and Crisis in the Age of the Global Credit. Uh, then she published uh, Financial Alchemy in Crisis, uh, the End of Liquidity, the Liquidity Illusion. And finally, the one that she has uh, referred to the more, um, Sabotage, The Business of Finance, which is from 2020. Uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, Professor Robin uh, Palin. So thank you, Anastasia, for uh, uh, giving us this uh, very impressive uh, overview that I believe has enriched very much this analysis of the whole that we are making now. Uh, I would like to ask um, Her Excellency Mrs. Charity Haneni in Chimunya, uh, Executive Secretary of the African Union Advisory Board on Corruption. She's still with us. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Hanene will be uh, joining us in the afternoon, but we did have, we have received a couple of questions on gender, and we wanted to know if you are with us, dear Charity, um, uh, to present them to you. Um, uh, as mentioned at the beginning of the seminar, yes, uh, thank you for putting your camera on. Um, it, it's quite an honor for us to have you. Um, uh, so again, um, Her Excellency Mrs. Charity Hanene Chimunja is Executive Secretary of the African Union Advisory Board on Corruption. And let me present to you, the first question is with general on gender and the second one is a little more on Africa. It says, in the global fight against corruption, would it make a difference to appoint more women to positions of influence and power so they can become the champions in the fight against corruption? Quite an interesting question. Um, and you have the floor there, yeah, Jerry. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Alex, for giving me that floor. And uh, let me start by saying that uh, it's been exciting to sit through this panel and uh, get the diverse insights and perspectives uh, on how corruption interfaces with uh, the five global alliances that have been identified. It's been very, very enriching, and uh, I appreciate. Now, coming specifically to your to your question. Uh, and I think it's one area where we need to do more research. I know that a uh, bit has been done to the effect that uh, uh, women are uh, much more uh, responsible when it comes to issues of uh, anti-corruption. And uh, it's been said that uh, if you want to fight corruption, appoint more women uh, to decision-making positions because mainly women are I think they're a bit, uh, they are not as daring as, as men and they have that uh, sixth sense to do the right thing uh, every time. But I think like I've said, it's something that needs a bit more research so that uh, we can speak to, to it with uh, conclusive uh, results. And on this note, perhaps uh, Professor Barrington, I think uh, I'll, I'll be your student not too long from now because actually colleagues from UNITA had given me a title that I don't have. They were referring to me as uh, Dr. Nchimunya, but I haven't yet read for my, my PhD. So I think I should uh, do something along those lines so that as we advise, then we can advise from uh, an informed uh, perspective. But I know that uh, there's been that perception for a long time and most scholars actually may hold, uh, scholars and the practitioners hold that view that uh, women are less uh, prone to be to be corrupt. But of course, we've seen uh, some women in recent years in different governments who've been uh, uh, cited for uh, corruption and, and all that. So perhaps, like I've indicated, it's better we research on it and then we can 
give a conclusive uh, uh, response. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And a follow up question very, very fast. I'm very sure we have only 10 more minutes to go and I need to go back to Professor Barrington and other speakers. But the case of Africa, of course, very much a priority for the United Nations, uh, very much admired for the efforts to fight corruption, but at the same time, very much frustrating because as I come from Latin America, so it's not only Africa, by the way, uh, we have the same uh, sour flavor in our mouth that we try and try but not necessarily achieve and achieve. So let me ask you from the perspective of, of Africa and, and, and the question that we have received from the floor is particularly on the private sector. So it says, how can we lower the risk of corruptions uh, from the private sector influencing unduly governments? Um, what can be done? So the private sector at the same time we participate more, provides investment and create jobs. They stop. Uh, bribing public officials. What is it that we need to do? Quite an interesting question from the perspective of Africa. Can you tell us something on the private sector? Uh, thank you so much again for that question. I think from the African perspective, uh, when you look at the African Union Convention on Preventing and uh, Combating Corruption, uh, member states as well as the African Union Advisory Board Against Corruption, we are supposed to be working with the private sector to ensure that um, they don't uh, uh, supply uh, corruption. They are not on the supply side of corruption, but they work with governments to actually fight uh, corruption. And um, perhaps at the level of, of the board, we have not done much uh, in terms of uh, different uh, programs uh, with the private sector, but there are certain member states of the African Union that have specific uh, um, uh, interventions uh, done alongside with the with the private sector because the more you work with the private sector as a government, I think the better opportunities for you to to really fight corruption from from that angle because both government and private sector they need to work hand in hand. If uh, corruption is allowed to thrive, then even in terms of the investments of the private sector, they will be sort of affected. So the more governments and the private sector work together the better the prospect of uh, winning the fight against uh, corruption. I thank you. Uh, thanks to you indeed. Uh, thank you for adding this perspective that we very much needed. So allow me to use um, the last uh, minutes or the few minutes that we have left uh, to present a question to Professor Barrington and then uh, one or two more if, if time allows. So Professor Barrington, as mentioned uh, before, we receive a question from the floor, from the participants. Uh, by the way, thanks to all of you, um, uh, we are uh, friends that have decided to join us. 122 of you are still with us after almost two hours that show a lot of stamina and a lot of interest in the topic. It's quite encouraging for us, more than 20 countries represented. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Now, I, I will present the question to Professor Warrington. He says, uh, from the floor. My question is to Professor Warrington. Is there a correlation between uh, autocracy, increased mil militarization of a co uh, state, uh, uh, corruption and klepto kleptopractic uh, tactics. Is there a correlation there when you have a tyrant and a dictator? Uh, and then more specifically, what role does the long-term legacies of liberation movement is in South Africa, Zimbabwe and others have uh, when it comes to actually fighting systemic corruption? It's a very specific question on autocracy and corruption, but if you can give us some comments, Professor Barrington, thank you very much. Thank you. It, it, those are both great questions. And in fact, I, I would like to say that there are many, many very interesting questions in the Q&A. Um, unfortunately, there isn't time to answer all those. But um, uh, on this one specifically, yes, there is a well-known correlation um, between uh, autocracy and kleptocracy. Um, and I think it comes in a way back to the points we were discussing earlier around transparency, that the more closed a society, uh, the easier it is for those in power to um, exploit the wealth of the society and not to be held to account. Um, you know, the, the slightly optimistic thing here is that um, uh, if you're a kleptocrat in a relatively closed society and you've stolen lots of money from the health budget, the education budget, the UN, you know, wherever you steal it from, um, what do you do with the money? Well, generally, uh, and this comes to Anastasia's field, it goes through the international financial system. 
um, and uh, it will flow through and possibly end up in uh, London, in Dubai, uh, in Hong Kong, in New York. Um, so, you know, there are jurisdictions in which there is a strong rule of law uh, and in which um, those who um, uh, have stolen the money in the first place uh, don't have such influence. So it is possible to do something about it, at least to remove the stolen assets from those who have, the kleptocrats who have stolen them. Um, but yes, you know, to, to give a very clear answer, there is a clear correlation between a lack of transparency, autocracy um, and uh, uh, kleptocracy. Uh, the second question is very interesting, the question of what we what is known as state capture. Um, what happens when uh, a government is running a country not in the interests of its citizens, but in the interests of itself uh, to enrich itself and to maintain its power? A pattern which we see, you know, across the world in uh, uh, countries in all continents um, happening um, from time to time. Um, well, the, the interesting part of the question, I think, is how does that link to um, effectively liberation movements? Uh, and um, one of the features we see is that uh, when liberation movements, and you see ZANU-PF, for example, in Zimbabwe, or indeed the ANC in South Africa, um, when they are victorious, uh, they have huge popular support. Um, and uh, Sometimes those leaders um, turn out to be not the people you would want to leave the country in a period of peace. Uh, and they turn out to be people who are very hungry for power uh, and uh, very repressive and very kleptocratic. Um, and uh, yet they still retain the support of the population because they have won the war of liberation or the fight for liberation. Uh, so you do see this phenomenon, um, and I might say it's also playing out a little bit in the United Kingdom at the moment, where a pro-Brexit government still maintains uh, some degree of popular support, um, even though it has uh, a series of um, ethical and integrity scandals. Uh, so what you often find is that state capture um, is um, easier in situations where there has been some kind of uh, liberation movement uh, because you maintain the support of citizens far beyond the point at which uh, most citizens would uh, would tolerate your behavior as a government thank you thank you very much uh, for those comments uh, for making us uh, think on the realities of politics and these type of governments um, uh, especially with examples um, uh, very valid today now, I do have one last question. Uh, thank you, Professor Barrington. Uh, and now to, to our colleague Anastasia, uh, Professor Nesbeth I, I do have uh, one last question for you, uh, also received from the floor, which is quite interesting. So uh, here it is. Uh, in the global fight against corruption, everyone has a responsibility. So what are the strengths of developing countries to combating corruption? Um, should we simply follow the examples of advanced economies and developed countries, or do we also have the strengths in the poorer world? Anastasia. Uh, thank you. It's an important question. Um, the traditional answer would be yes, kind of follow the established examples of transparent systems, uh, you know, establishing the market checks and balances uh, to the ex to an extent it's correct because as uh, Robert Barrington has just said that there is a correlation between um, a closed society with an uncontrolled um, elite and of course the, the availability to um, to steal money or, or engage in other corrupt practices but um, I think my research in finance has made me much more I don't want to say cynical, but realistic or very skeptical of, of these examples in a sense that, of course, there is no uh, or le proportionately less uh, rampant corruption in, in uh, advanced economies or in developed, in financially sophisticated um, uh, systems, kind of institutional, if you want, corruption or structural corruption. But the practices that exist within private systems, within very, in some way, untransparent systems, and finance is very non-transparent. So if, we, for example, to give you an example, if we want to regulate now a banking system in a particular country, who do you want to regulate it with? And that goes to the idea of state capture, in a sense that, you, of course, you need competent people. You need to pay your competent staff very well 
to be able to respond to the problems that arise out of incredibly innovative, very maneuvering, uh, dynamic, fluid, fragmented, always evolving uh, finance or banking or, or a monetary system that thrives on innovation, that thrives on escape from on, on maneuverability and international arbitrage. Otherwise, it wouldn't be global and it wouldn't be um, so financialized to the extent that we're used today. Um, I think in a developing context, in a developing country context, I, at the moment, I cannot think of a better uh, historically proven example than the Asian developmental model in all its versions. It's not just we're not talking about one particular state, but it's it's an example of a model where a combination of uh, strategic state planning, strategic investment by the public, strategic support to particular industries, encouragement of the market and participation, but importantly, freedom of speech, democratic participation, and a system, a working system of checks and balances has proven that this is your model of sustainability and um, more or less a controlled financial integration into the world capital market. It doesn't, I cannot, I, I don't want to say that it's problem free or uh, can be universally applied tomorrow morning, um, but it seems to be the um, the example that, that was continually implemented, has proven itself, has survived through crisis and has generated benefits to society. So, um, if you don't want to, to mimic a, a Western or an advanced country model, and I, I see all the reasons not to do it, because it, it by itself it's deficient, not transparent, and you know, I spend my academic life writing about its failures, really, um, then I cannot think of a better example than that. And in fact, the role of women in that particular system, going back to the previous speaker, is very important. Very much so. Uh, thank you very much, Anastasia. I'm going to ask, uh, before we conclude, um, all our distinguished speakers to put the cameras on. We would like to have a group picture that we will be very pleased to put on the UNITAR website, on the Roller website, uh, perhaps on social media. Uh, it would be much appreciated if you can collect your cameras. But while we do that, and uh, uh, to our colleague Charity as well, uh, it would be uh, uh, much appreciated. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to express my appreciation to my team at UNITAR, uh, both uh, Ms. Ana Lucia Giacome and our, our colleague uh, Veysa Noor uh, uh, from Turkey, Ana Lucia Giacome here in Geneva, and also to the team at ROLAC uh, in Doha, our career, uh, colleague uh, Sheryar, our colleague uh, Qatar, uh, Dr. Refaye, um, uh, who has uh, been spared in this uh, from the beginning. And uh, to all of you, distinguished panelists, it's been a pleasure to have you, Professor Barrington, Professor Svetailova, Mr. Contreras, Ambassador Sobhan, uh, Professor uh, uh, Kanan Sokulu, uh, Ms. Uh, Hanene Chimunya, and also in absentia, Dr. Ali Benfetai Samari and Ambassador Luis Gallegos. Um, it's been quite an interesting conversation to all of you, dear participants, uh, impressive, but uh, we still have 119 after two hours, uh, my respect to all of you. George, remember, uh, we would uh, love to have you again for session number two, beginning at 2 p.m. Central European time, also two hours today, this afternoon, and then session number three tomorrow morning, also at 10 a.m. The link to connect is exactly the same. And with that, um, on behalf of UNITAR and ROLAC, thank you very, very much uh, for joining us today. So, Ana Lucia. You are taking the picture and you tell me when we are uh, finished. Is that okay? All right. I think you took the picture. Um, uh, let me just make sure that I do it also with my phone. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you. And we will connect uh, in the afternoon. With this, the session of this conference is adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye.